And he said to me, do you do it full time? And at the time I was like, no. He said, why not? Just take the plunge. And at the time, I didn't understand that. You know, we're living in a world now where the, the average person will have nine to 15 jobs in their life. Uh, and I just... Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another episode of 18AvenuePodcast.com. I am your host, Rico Bottles, and today joining me here is my very special guest, Curtis Gloom. Hey, Curtis, how are you doing? Um, thank you so much for this opportunity, uh, not to waste any time. How did you get to this point? Well, um, several years ago, I had an opportunity to buy a gallery in Camnor, bought a gallery, and then we just decided to do our, our own thing, uh, my wife and I, Andrea and myself. We just wanted to have a little quaint gallery with local artists and artists from across Canada all the way over to Quebec. And it just, it just kind of grew and certainly has a feel of its own and a, a feel of a certain brand and um, a certain ambiance. Um, personally, as an artist myself, I've been painting for over 30 years. Um, I had the AKA real job for quite some time <laughs> uh, until I could find, to, I got found, uh, I got to a point in my life where I could transition and just be a full-time artist and do what I really love to do. Was that a hard transition? Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, you're going from uh, working at a job where you've got a guaranteed sort of paycheck. Um, but I quickly realized that in today's world, I mean, really nothing's guaranteed. Mm -hmm. So in essence, you're basically working for yourself. The biggest transition for myself was just understanding that now my job now is just to create things that are hopefully so beautiful and moving that people have to have them. So my job is to create beautiful things. And uh, how did you become an artist? Well, you know what? That's a, that's a good question. I was, it was always in me. Um, I started painting when I was about, honestly, probably about 14, built an easel, discovered that I couldn't paint. Wait a minute, there's more to this, right? And it just built from there. I'm pretty much predominantly self-taught, read a ton of books. Um, I mean, I started before the advent of the, of the internet. Now so much is online. You can mm -hmm. learn a lot and uh, accelerate with the waterfall effect, right? And just learn really quickly new skills. Um, but I learned my craft through just uh, trial and error, and um, I developed something unique, you know, uh, watercolors that are varnished, so there's no need for glass on them. And then I have acrylics that I do that are extremely colorful. So I'm known as a, a colorful expressionist landscape painter. Um, I mean, I walked into the shop a few weeks back, and I was blown away by all the colors. And for people who hasn't had the opportunity to really come in here and explore it and see the type of work you do and the type of paintings that you have here, it, it's just mind blowing. As I was reading a little bit on you there, it talks about some of your inspiration and there was a particular film that perhaps you seen back then that really got you. Was that when, and what was the name of that film and how did that come about? Well, it was a documentary about uh, watercolors, Tony Altley, who's mm. no longer with us, but I was probably 14 years old, I believe. And I was watching this thinking, wow, he's creating these beautiful paintings with just a few brush strokes, and they're emotionally moving. They're just, just gorgeous. And that's what kind of prompted me to maybe I should try painting. Um, but I started as an oil painter and then I discovered that <clears throat> there was a few <coughs> different things. I Take your time. <laughs> we will edit this part out. No, not really. <laughs> this is the best part. This is the kind of thing that goes viral. Yeah. <laughs> you turned so red now. Oh, I just. <clears throat> Are you all right? Yeah, I'm okay. <clears throat> I literally something flew in my mouth and I inhaled it. Oh, okay. So um, I was watching a documentary about Tony Ali and I was amazed with how he could create beautiful paintings with just a few basic brush strokes and, and one brush actually. Um, they were watercolors. And I thought, you know, I should try painting. I started with oils, um, discovered that with oils, you spend <clears throat> a lot of time cleaning brushes and not so much time painting. Mm -hmm. Um, and I didn't have a lot of time. Uh, I was going to school and I wanted to keep it simple. Mm -hmm. So I, I started watercolor painting. 
and I could find that I could, you know, whenever I wanted to go to it, take them out, paint, practice, get better, because that's what it's all about. And just over the years, it just developed. Eventually, I went from painting just watercolors to varnishing watercolors, and then I made the next jump where I started doing acrylic paintings because I wanted to go bigger and even more colorful. Uh, I still do both. Mm-hmm. And uh, neither one is a favorite of mine. I love doing both of them. It just depends on what I'm trying to paint and express. Is, is watercolor painting um, difficult? Um, that's kind of, it's kind of like uh, fly fishing. Everybody thinks, don't go fly fishing. It's super difficult. You'll never learn how to. Right. Again, it's practice, right? But my style is very loose and impressionistic. And if I have a mistake happen or a... a um, an accident while I'm painting, I will turn that accident to into something in that painting. I'm very loose with it when I paint. I'm not, um, there's the old English style where everything's very exacting mm-hmm. and you're putting down fine washes of pigment. I don't paint in that matter. I just do whatever it takes to get the job done. I'll use razor blades and scrape into the paper and sticks and all sorts of stuff and gouache. So it's a little bit of the, out of the box. Mm-hmm. For me, it's just not as difficult anymore. Certainly, it's difficult if I try something very new and different. But I've been—I paint every day, so it's a lot of practice, right? So. And that would have been my next uh, question. Uh, when when you are a writer, the advice you get is um, write every day, every single day, and eventually, what happens is um, the inspiration come. Um, do you say the same thing for? painting as well or do you initially start off with an idea before going into the painting and executing that well that's a, again a good question i the next 10 paintings are already up here got it They're in the back of my mind i always have like she's you know just can't get to them fast enough because i probably have something i'm currently working on mm-hmm. um but when i'm teaching people I, I tell them uh don't paint once a week for eight hours you'll hate painting especially you'll get done at the end of the day, you'll be burnt out. You won't be happy with what you do. Take 15 to 40 minutes, maybe each day and do a quick sketch, Got it. do a quick painting and the waterfall effect will take over. Eventually the more you do that, the quicker you'll learn and the quicker you'll get better. Mm-hmm. So it's like, if you want to learn how to draw and sketch, um, you should always have a sketch pad with you and take, you know, 10 minutes, five minutes, you see something, sketch it quickly, put it down you'll get better faster. As opposed to taking an entire Yeah. I also teach people, I mean, sorry to interrupt, but I also teach people to, you know, quite often I'll see they'll have like 50 brushes. Here's the four brushes you need. Learn how to use your materials, your four brushes. Here's the eight pigments you need. Learn how to use those. You can certainly in the future grow from there because you don't want to be overwhelmed. It's Mm -hmm. like teaching someone how to golf. If you teach them how to swing the ball, you know, head down, you know, eye on the ball, hands together. It did become so overwhelming to right. swing the club. Just keep it really simple and um, paint every day for a little bit. Now, you also do acrylics painting as well. Is it a different process? Do you now use different brushes for acrylic than you would, say, for water yeah. painting? So okay. uh, the materials are certainly different. I do use, you, you know, acrylic brushes for my acrylics and watercolors brushes for my watercolors, different materials. The process is also, to be honest with you, that was a struggle for me to learn because it mm. took a while for me to learn that acrylic is really almost an entirely opposite process. Got it. In, in watercolors, uh, I typically end the painting with my uh, darkest darks last. In, in acrylic, uh, pardon me, in watercolor painting, my darkest darks last. In a uh, watercolor painting, it's the opposite. Mm-hmm. Uh, in acrylic painting, I'll end the painting with my lightest lights last. Completely opposite process. Okay. Uh, let's put some time frame on it. You've been doing this for 30 years. Mm-hmm. Someone's sitting there thinking to themselves, you know what, let me go out and start this process. Um, just for timeline purposes, how long did it take you to finally know that, okay, you know what, I can really do this. And at what point did you even sell your first painting? Um, well, uh, when I first started, I always saw some potential 
And this is generally what happens for people that have the AKA bug mm -hmm. desire to want to paint. It's a lot like maybe wanting to play a musical instrument. It's in you, you know, what you're doing at first there, you see potential mm -hmm. and there's something that captivates you and you keep wanting to do it again. So you return to it and you do it again. And again, that's back to practice. And the more you practice, the quicker you get, the better you get. Um, if you don't practice, it's not going to happen. I have taught people and I've seen people have a lot of potential and um, they stick with it and they start to enjoy it more and more because it becomes less stressful right? Uh, because it's become looser. And the more you paint, the more you and your style will come out. Um, so you just get better faster. I sold my first painting probably 20 years ago. Uh, so 10 years when you were already into it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I used to just do it and, oh, this is kind of fun and mm -hmm. give them away. Right. Right. Um, and then I did um, a show where, um, you know, it's all relative. I had paintings where, you know, a full sheet watercolor, like a 22 by 30 inch painting would be about $550, if I remember correctly, with a simple frame on it. And mm -hmm. my first show sold one in like five minutes. I thought, wow, what? Wow. Um, but, you know, people liked where I, what I was doing at the time, but certainly evolved. My stuff's very different now. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I saw potential early on. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um, now, because you're not only a painter, you're also, you also own an art gallery. Well, my wife owns a gallery. Your wife owns yeah. a gallery. Um, She's just offset over there. She's camera shy. She's the boss. <laughs> uh oh, here she comes at it. <laughs> <laughs> she could really just come in, really. Um, so where did the idea um, for the business aspect of it come from Come from for you? That's another good question. Um, I had been in other galleries, some of which the relationship was uh, challenging. Mm -hmm. And then I, I used to be in a gallery, uh, Alley Cat in Bragg Creek. Um, a lot of Calgarians still talk about that gallery. Um, hasn't been around for some time, but I learned a lot from that owner, mm -hmm. how to treat artists, how to run a gallery. And this was all just through observation and I would just ask him a few questions, but I really respected how, uh, gentleman's name was James that ran and owned the gallery. I really re under, uh, respected how he ran the gallery. And then I was seeing how artists were treated at other galleries, including myself. And then the opportunity came up, I mentioned earlier that had an opportunity to ballot buy a gallery and I thought, well, that'd be probably a good idea. And then we can just do what we want with it. Right. That's right. Um, and certainly in this gallery, you've had a look around. It has a very unique feel and ambiance and look to it. It's more casual. I uh, we never wanted to have a gallery that was stoutish and, um, kind of pretentious. We didn't want that kind of a feel. Right. So this is almost kind of like a gallery you would find in, uh, maybe in downtown Quebec, City, lots of color, mm. casual, fun place to be. We frankly get a lot of customers that come here and they come here just to visit. Hey, how you doing? And they may not buy a painting, mm -hmm. but it's kind of like, you know, you don't go to the barber to get your hair cut. You right. go there for the conversation right? and a haircut might happen. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. <laughs> That is so true. That's copyrighted. You can't use that. I can't use that. <laughs> so <Sorry. laughs> I'm sure we can get away with it. Um, uh, what was the key driving force for you to become an entrepreneur? Um, just, you know, I was, I had been laid off and right sized. Uh, you know, we're living in a world now where the, the average person will have nine to 15 jobs in their life. Uh, and I just got kind of tired of that and getting bounced around because you kind of get yourself established with a company. Everything's going cool. It's like, oh, by the way, you're done now. We don't need you anymore. Bye bye. Bye bye. Yeah. So I kind of got disenfranchised with that whole kind of uh, aspect of how life is being lived. And I mean, to have an opportunity to do what you love to do, who doesn't want to do that? Absolutely. You know? It'd be like the scuba diver that's uh, forced to be a skydiver instead. Right. What is that about? Right. right? So that's a, that's a very valid point. So many people would probably never know. Um, I was listening to uh, Spike Lee, a filmmaker, um, and he was talking about how uh, like thousands of people would go to their grave working a job that they absolutely hate. Mm -hmm. 
76% of people actually hate what they're doing for a living. Mm -hmm. However, rooted in that statistic is the fact that most people hate, not necessarily the company they're working for, but the person they're working and reporting to. Mm -hmm. um, but still, I thought, I saw that number, I thought, well, wow, life's too short to be living that way. Mm -hmm. like, you know, or that's be like living in an area where you don't really want to live. Mm -hmm. You know, if, if you don't like it, then change it and um, move forward, right? Right. You know, somebody, um, somebody watching this would say, well, Curtis did it. I could probably do it myself. Well, that's, you know what? That leads into, and I don't know, you probably had a good question, but that's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> you <have> to <laughs> <laughs> no, um, I remember early on when years ago I got uh, allowed to go into the Calgary Stampede. I got jurored in. And um, I remember meeting some of my mentors down there, particularly Brent Hyten, who's a world famous artist. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, do you do it full time? And at the time I was like, no. He said, why not? Just take the plunge. And at the time, I didn't understand that. I did not, it didn't even, it was like, what? That's crazy talk. Take right? the plunge, yeah. What are you talking about? I don't box. Right, because you have a lot of other things going on maybe in your life, maybe you've got kids, you've got a family. Absolutely. Or you've got a career that's like, well, geez, that pays really good. So I was like, but you know, bottom line is you gotta kind of move to where your heart is, right? So, and that's, that what I think was the hidden message and if you read about him and where he came from and what he did um, and how he got to the point where he became a full-time artist, it's like, well, yeah, take the plunge, do it. You will find a way. It's like, I knew a guy who was a floral artist and this guy was built like a house. He was a bodybuilder guy. If you met him, you'd think grandma was doing his floral paintings. No, it's this guy. And guess what? He just loved doing them and he became a professional floral artist and um, he learned how to sell his work. There's galleries that are spe specifically sell that genre of work. And then he got contracts with publishing, for example, this sounds nuts, but putting his work on Kleenex boxes all contributed to his income. Mm -hmm. So you got to kind of think out of the box and go, okay, you know, I'm an abstract artist. Well, maybe you should be showing in San Francisco or something, right? Right. Well, got to think out of the box. That's a very important point. And I'm not glad because my question was, definitely going to come about and you would have told me that anyway but that's I knew that because you're I'm psychic I love that I love that so you know the next question then <laughs> let's just go from <laughs> this is great <laughs> um you know and people like you mentioned you will find a way um, for a lot of people whether or not they're absolutely passionate for about some certain things or not. Um, I think one of the biggest hurdle in everybody's life is this idea of money. How did the funding for this come to you? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> well, you kind of, you got to look at things pragmatically too and go, okay, can I make this work? How many paintings do I have to sell a year? And you know, you kind of work through the math. I got to a point where I was like, okay, now I can do this full time because I, I think I know how many paintings I can sell. The scary thing is you got to think of, especially this year, we got COVID happening. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've at the gallery taken on some artists that are new to being full time artists. And a few of them have asked the question, well, how many paintings would you sell of mine a month? Well, I really have no idea. But back to what I said earlier, your job is to focus on producing work that's so good that people have to have it. If you just focus on that and put it in the right places and market it the right way, then we will, you know, we'll sell it. If you do really good work, mm -hmm. we'll sell it. You know, it's sometimes artists wonder, particularly with our artists that are geographically further away from us, mm -hmm. send us images in advance and we'll tell us, tell you what we want you to ship because there's shipping involved. Um, and they'll wonder why, you know, they may do 10 paintings and we take these five or six because I believe we can sell those. They have elements in them that are sellable. That comes with experience, right? Knowing mm -hmm. what people respond to. Um, so again, you know, that's back to the practicing experience, but you have to get, you get to a point where you kind of go, okay, can I make this work? Um, how many could I sell a year? Some artists, uh, we have some artists that take months to do a painting um, and you know, they sell for thousands of dollars. Um, 
but mathematically I, I'm not like that. I, you know, I brought in two paintings today. Mm-hmm. Um, they take me five to seven days to do. I know what I got to sell them at. So the math works. The other thing that we always talk to our artists about too, is the artist gallery relationship. You really have to respect and understand that relationship and why it's important. Uh, because galleries put in a lot of work behind the scenes, uh, like interviews mm-hmm. <laughs> and marketing, uh, very much where, you know, we put ourselves out on the line and, and really, uh, go to bat f- for you. You know, we've had some artists that wonder, well, I had a client that, uh, you took a commission for, there should be a finder's fee for that. Well, yeah, they found you because of our gallery and they came in our gallery and we've been working with that client for over a year. Now they're ready to have you do a piece for them because of the work we've done for you. Mm-hmm. They don't always see the, the, the behind the scenes work you do. Mm-hmm. So the, the artists hours you spent, yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, I paint every day, uh, start at eight in the morning. I may paint till one or two in the afternoon, then come down here, work till, hey, if we got people in here, we may close at five. Uh-oh, you got a customer in, you may be here till six, whatever it takes to get the job done, right? But I don't watch the wall clock anymore. I don't, I don't look at my watch, I'm gonna go home now because I love what I do. Mm-hmm. That's very important. Now, client reti- uh, retention is another thing. Um, how do you build a successful uh, customer base or how do you even maintain um, customers? Well, for us, we, we've tried to stay relevant to our customers. And what I mean by that, we really sit and watch what customers respond to. Um, you know, if I had a bludgeon seal on a harp seal on a, on a, on a, sheet of ice that's probably a tougher painting to sell <laughs> probably not going to be that popular right <laughs> but uh you know we've got a lot of people constantly come in here and they'll look around at all the artwork and this is the kind of compliments we get is oh, geez there's not a piece in here i don't like you better be listening to that um you know and that's not just selling yourself oh we have a real variety of work here uh, for example, we have one of Canada's top abstract artists, in my opinion, Barry Rafus. Um, we can explain to you why it's good abstract. A lot of galleries, it's kind of like the emperor's clothing. They can't explain to you really what makes good abstract art. Mm. We can. Um, but he's, you know, we've got one abstract artist right now. That's all we need because he's the best and his work sells. So, again, we're very fussy about what we carry here. Don't allow artists to use projectors or paint over photos. Our highly realism artists literally freehand, they don't even grid it out. It's amazing to watch them work. Wow. So it's again, very unique. And our customers, so back to our customers, our customers understand that. Um, We respect them that way, but we get a lot of customers who are first time art buyers. Um, So they have very different questions than experienced art buyers. Right. You know, they may be asking, you better be able to, well, here's an example. You better be able to ask, answer uh, why a painting is $5,000 and not $500 and sitting on um, eBay or Kijiji. Right. And that's very important. Absolutely. But we treat our customers with a lot of respect. We go um, the extra mile, if you will, with customer service, you know, may, might involve, uh, yeah, we'll come over to your place and hang it. I mean, that varies depending on COVID and what's going mm, on at the time, right. <laughs> you know, but we really try to help our customers out. And we get a lot of customers who buy multiples and they're repeat customers, typically in the gallery business, you know, customer will come in, they might buy a piece. If they're happy, they'll come back again, maybe buy one more. But we get a lot of customers that keep coming back because again, they love it's back to the barbershop contact uh, mm-hmm. concept. They come back here for the banter, the talk, the visit. Oh, maybe I'll buy something. Oh, geez, what's this? This is new. What mm-hmm. you, this is a new artist. Oh my gosh, what is this? And they're wowed, wowed enough, hopefully to buy it. Right. That's the kind of the business side of it. Absolutely. Um, and thank you for, I'm sure the, the people watching this, um, those are probably some concerns of theirs and hopefully these questions are catering to some of the question, uh, concerns well, that they may have. And yeah, you'll, you'll be surprised because some people really get technical with their questions. You know, they go, well, is this archival? Um, and that's typically a lot of times the experienced art buyer. Is this piece archival? Can I clean it? What's it painted with? What are the materials? Um, a lot of first-time art buyers, they may not have those questions. Absolutely not. But... Um, 
We also pride ourselves on, I should mention, that we only sell originals. We don't sell prints here. This is the one of shop. You buy it, it's uh, going to be the one of. You have it hanging on your wall, and it won't be printed on coffee mugs and underwear. Only and you are the only person with that painting. Exactly. So this is the one of shop. And people, they're happy to hear that. They're like, well, thank you for telling me. Wow. I've got the one of. It's not going to be out there in G clays and prints. This is a fantastic gallery. It's absolutely beautiful. I said that before. I think I've been talking about this now since I came here last time. And so you should. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> and I'm doing that. So hopefully I get my check. <laughs> it's almost Christmas, isn't it? What is that? Friday? Ooh. Yeah, right? Any other time, it'll have to be an each transfer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how many hours per day would you say that you put into this? Oh gosh, again, I mean, I don't clock watch, but it's eight to probably six every day, easily. And then there's, there are days, particularly in the summertime, long weekends, long weekend, don't have long weekends, you're here. Um, and um, usually, you know, you're here early. And I'm, when I say eight, I'm painting in my studio at eight. And then I come down here. Mm -hmm. um, so on a long weekend, I may be a uh, paint and I'll be here early. We open 11, but I'll be here for 10. And you may be here till six or seven because, you know, when it's when the sun's shining, it's time to make hay. If you've got customers in here and they're really interested in stuff, you stay. July long weekend is usually the busiest bar none weekend out of the entire year consistently. And... For us, the July long weekend, if the, the holiday day falls on a Friday, it goes, our long weekend business-wise will be from the Thursday th right through to the Monday. Mm -hmm. So it's not just three days. So that's where you really got to stay, you know, close to the business. Get a rainy day. If it's pouring rain, you could be possibly not busy at all because everybody stays inside or they can't go hiking and suddenly you're busy because they want to be indoors shopping. Mm -hmm. It's <laughs> very hard to predict, but you got to be here for it. Yeah. yeah. And how has um, being an entrepreneur affected your family life? What family? <laughs> 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 well, you know what? It's like, I think whether you're an entrepreneur or, I mean, again, when I had my corporate life, uh, the real job, so to speak, uh, it depends on the individual on how you manage that. But I make a point of trying not to bring it home. Uh, it is a little bit different, the dynamics of working with your wife. She's AAA, I'm AAA. We have a lot of really hardcore discussions. We'll just call it that <laughs> about what we're doing. And then I'll kind of say, well, logically we should do that or shouldn't do that because whereas Andrea the kind of leads more with her heart mm -hmm. um, but what the way we've tried to manage things there's things that I'm good at doing and there's things that Andrea is good at doing she does all the social media aspects mm -hmm. uh, like handling Facebook and then you met Kim who works for us um, she handles some of the social media aspects. I'm inept at doing social media. Guess what? I don't want to do that. It's like Steve Vai. He's a famous guitarist. He says, I don't work on the things that I'm not good at. I work on the things that I'm good at doing. I leave sense. the rest to someone else. If I'm not good at that, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to focus on what I'm not good at. Right. So. But some people have this idea to feel the need to kind of either learn everything or be somewhat or have an idea yeah that's called two things that's called control freak <laughs> gotcha <laughs> it's also called micromanaging you got to kind of get to a point where you know especially with our staff selling arts not like selling cups of coffee right absolutely not you're selling relationships here um you're selling stuff that on average here is at least two thousand uh, dollars and or more mm -hmm. um so you better be able to answer some questions and you better be able to adjust and adapt part of me to the conversation because some people have different needs than other people when it comes to the purchase. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we got a business to run, so it is about selling and the purchase. Um, so they might be wondering, well, tell me, usually goes, tell me about this artist. And they don't want to know that the artist stands in front of a canvas with a pack of razor blades ready to slit their wrists. They want to know that the artist is, um, you know, uh, 
paints from the heart and is, is inspired by their visions of the foothills and they express mm. it in a certain manner. They want to know about the passion uh, and the artist's journey, what got them there, right? So, yeah, you have to be adaptive. Yeah. No, thanks. Um, I feel like I didn't answer your question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're wrong with that anyway. We're wrong with it anyway. <laughs> we're wrong with it. Who's, uh, who's, who's judging? <laughs> I asked a question, you answer. But <laughs> isn't that how it works? <laughs> um, in terms of ideas, uh, how do you go about generating new ideas? Do you kind of do that as a, like a collaborative effort with the wife or how does that work? Definitely collaborative. Uh, here's a little bit about what happens. Um, a lot of times, and I'll give you an example. We've, we've a very specific example. We've now got here three fused glass artists. I don't know of a lot of galleries that have three top fused glass artists. They may have one fused glass artist. And what's a fused glass artist? Fused glass, that's when you're taking, basically you're taking glass, cutting it, and or working with glass particles and fusing it, you're melting it together to make a piece of art, whether it be a bowl wow. or a scene or uh, something unique, okay? So it's very sculptural. Mm -hmm. We started with one, guess what? We have three now in total um, because we're like, wow, that kind of worked wood sculptures aren't working, let's do more glass sculptures. So we kind of, you know, again, focus on what's working and move away from what's not working. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, and that almost applies to any business, right? I mean, are you going to do pragmatically, you need to make a living. You're going to do more of what's not working? Probably not. Right? That's right. <laughs> so, yeah. That's right. Uh, so it's definitely an evolution. We make a lot of our decisions. Uh, and, you know, my wife, she's an interior decorator also. She has mm -hmm. an eye for certain things that I don't have an eye. And there's been instances where a new artist wants to show here and I'll look at it and go, well, I don't know. There's something about it. I like it, but I'm not sure. My wife will say, no, no, no. Trust me. Here's what I see in it. And so sometimes you have to park your ego and, um, you know, that other people have uh, a very valid opinion and you have to validate that. Right. Not everybody's going to run the marathon the same. Mm hmm as long as they finish the marathon. Absolutely. And, and that's, uh, you have to, again, back to the, your earlier question, um, with staff, um, you have to let people do things the way they do them. They may not sell a painting the way you would sell that painting, but the foundation's there and they may do it differently as long as they arrive at the same end result, hopefully. So, Absolutely. Yeah. Now, that's very important that you're saying that. Um, would you consider yourself successful and how do you define success? Oh, good question. A lot of people, um, you know, I think I define success as, you know, are you doing what you really want to do? You know, and, and I'm doing what I really want to do now. That That's it. I like that. I'm also, and you can take a little time to realize that what you're doing is you're actually affecting people's lives. And we will literally get people come in, whether it's one of my paintings or it might be a, another work of art from a different artist here. And they'll go, my gosh, I got to tell you, every time I come home, I could have the worst day at work. I come home and look at my Martin Chasse or my Serge Dubé painting and I smile. I love mm -hmm. it. It's changed my house it's changed how i live it affects me every day i love it thank you for that so you're actually impacting people's lives i think you know when you think of your environment your home environment mm -hmm. um when people start to hang original art in their house they suddenly go wow a i want more of that because it looks really good but it makes my environment feel different and more enjoy enjoyable and, and i i like my surroundings better like, could you imagine if we had all the paintings in here hung upside down and backwards? <laughs> it's like, what a weird environment. I'm not comfortable there. Probably won't buy anything. I'm not happy. Reminds right. me of something out of one of those quirky movies. <laughs> <laughs> was it Chocolate Factory? What's that movie called? Anyway. <laughs> you Willy Wonka? <laughs> yeah. I haven't seen it. <laughs> I don't know why I thought about that when you said that. <laughs> um, uh, do you believe that there is a formula for success? Um, I think you can be, when it comes to a formula for success, a little too textbooky at times. Um, 
my background, I was educated in economics and statistics, so I can crunch the numbers. But at the end of the day, there's a point at which it's like a race car driver. You got to at some point get behind the wheel and just drive, Mm. you know, and again, it, this is where it becomes a, a valuable lesson where you start to learn to move towards more what's working and stop doing less of what's working. In business, they have a thing called um, continual process improvement. You should be going to work every day and trying to continually improve processes or things that you do so that you're a more efficient and hopefully you make more money, you sell more, all those sort of things. Maybe distribution's better, you uh, are quicker to respond to a customer's needs, all those sort of aspects. Mm -hmm. Um, But at the end of the day, you got to move with your heart and move towards what you think might work, you know, with logic applied at some, you know, would I bring um, paintings of kitty cats in here running and catching yarn balls? Probably not. Cause it's probably not going to work. No, <laughs> they may be the cutest darn paintings you've seen right. and people will look at them and go, Oh, isn't that cute? But will they buy them? That's right. probably not. Right. So you got to move towards what will probably work. But again, back to, you know, we're very passionate about carrying beautiful and uh, well done art, art that's very good compositionally, very strong. So is that your your question? (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) No, I think you went into it and that's what I like. It's um, that's great. Um, Do you have any favorite aspects of being an entrepreneur or do you just kind of? Yeah, you know, um, oddly enough, one of the things I really enjoy is if I want to do something or change something, I don't have to go to a committee of nine or 12 or whatever, present the idea, wait for their feedback, tweak it. I can just do Do it. it. Now, you know, I don't have billions and millions of dollars behind me, but... Um, and it's all relevant, right? It's all, all relative is what I meant to say. Um, you could make the smallest little adjustment or, mm-hmm. or make the smallest little decision, but it could have a huge impact. Sometimes you get surprised. We've, we've brought in artists who you don't think are going to be that popular. Holy cow, get out of the way. We need more work from them because we're selling like hotcakes. And so that's a pleasant surprise. Sometimes you get surprised in the opposite way. And that just has to do with what people are responding to. We had an artist one time without mentioning any names. Um, my wife looked at this painter's work and said, it's almost like this person's just going through the motions and painting with no emotion. Technically really well done. Honest to goodness, true, honest to God truth, had customers come in on two separate occasions say, it's got no emotion. It's well done. That's it. Hmm. Guess what? In six months, sold none of that artist's work. Had to send it all back. Didn't work. People, it was tangible. People actually noticed. Wow. Is that kind of like a grace period that you would have an artist's work hanging on your wall? Is there like a timeline where it's like, okay, I will leave it here for this amount of time because if it's not selling, clearly a decision has to be made. Well, yeah, we, we do. You know pretty early on um, whether it's going to work or not. And Again, I said earlier, we really watch to what people respond to. Mm-hmm. And it's interesting because I just had this conversation with someone else the other day. And I said, you know, you've got a problem if a piece of art's hanging on the wall and people look at it and they just go, hmm. They walk by and they go to the next artist or whatever. Mm-hmm. They don't ask any questions. <clears throat> you know, you've possibly got something good going when they look at a piece and they look at the price tag or the last, Oh, tell me about this artist. they will be more. They want to know more. Right. About it. Right. So you've, you've piqued their interest or you've gotten their interest. Um, the wow factor comes in whether they're really moved to buy it. Right. Um, I've always said too, good art almost basically sells itself because it gets to a point where people will go, I've got to have that. I just love it. That's exactly usually what they say out comes the wall and they'll, they'll purchase the piece, right? Um, but um, there are instances where we do have in our contract a stipulation where, you know, if we're not selling anything, then it goes back. But there, there's some artists that are they're full-time or 
they really understand the business and they want to know, Hey, am I painting the wrong genre of work? Mm -hmm. Uh, because I do mountain pieces specific to your market, or they may need to tweak something in their work. So it sells. If they're open to that, then that's a good conversation, right? Because if they plan on making a living and doing this full time and, and actually selling pieces, then hopefully they have those sort of questions and they want that kind of feedback. Me as an artist, I have other galleries that represent me. Please tell me if I'm painting the wrong stuff for you because it's not helping you. Right. If it's not helping me and vice right. versa, right? It's symbiotic. So, wow. Yeah, that is, that is important. And do you find that um, in this line of work, because you know, we're artists we're always so sort of stubborn, hard headed at times and very much into their own. Can be. Yeah. Style. Yeah. Um, well, you know, we've said, um, I got to be careful with this because sometimes we say, you know, managing artists is, and you know, my wife says it's like managing Count Choculus. Mm -hmm. <laughs> They're off doing their own thing, right? And they just, no, I don't want to do that. I just want to paint this. It's like, oh, goodness gracious, here we go, right? But you, you're managing also personalities. It's no different than managing people in, uh, that are working for you in a company. You have to understand that, again, back to my point, if you know, they may finish the marathon, not how you might run it, but as long as they finish the marathon. So you got to let them do their thing a little bit. At some point in time, a lot of times what happens in a relationship is they'll ask, well, what's my, what's, how are people reacting to my work? And then that's your first hint that they want to know why it's selling or why it's not selling. Yeah. Um, so now we're going to, for the rest of this interview, it's going to be on advice and also a little bit of a personal life so we can know where you come from. You currently reside in Alberta, Canmore. Canmore. Yeah. Um, and have you always lived here? Were you born here? No, I, I, I grew up in Northern Ontario, Thunder Bay when I was a kid and uh, the outskirts of uh, Sudbury, Ontario. Mm-hmm. Um, and I just got to a point in life. It was one of those another epiphanal moments where it's like, okay, I'm living in a city where drinking beer and skidooing is pretty much all there is to do. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't into that. And I always loved the mountains, loved the West horse, used to horseback ride, fly fish and ski. And I thought, what the heck am I doing living here? So I moved out West and I like that, you know, this was almost 30 years ago. I liked that it was a more of an entrepreneurial vibe in the city of Calgary. It was, it was quite different. The demographics in Calgary has changed in the last 30 years, certainly. Mm. The vibe has changed. It's much more um, uh, vibrant and it's more of a hustle bustle and, uh, you know, get there quickly sort of thing. Uh, Calgary's got certainly some challenges right now economically. Everybody knows that. Mm -hmm. and so does all of Canada right now. Um, but I did like the, I, I like the Western kind of vibe and it was more laid back, but it was more entrepreneurial in a lot of ways too. And that kind of drew you. It kind of drew side. me in. Yeah. And I wanted to live somewhere where I, you know, I felt I was in a better environment for myself. Uh, what specifically drew you to the mountains and how did you find out? Because a lot of people may have this idea or they know that, um, like for me, for instance, I grew up in Newfoundland. Mm. And so I knew that eventually I would have to move out, but I didn't have a destination in mind. So what I did was I spent some time just moving around Canada. So essentially just traveling, right? Well, that's probably good. That's a good plan. That's a good yeah. way to go about it because you kind of- It's, it's expensive. It's an expensive plan, but- <laughs> It's an expensive endeavor, but you kind of figure out where do I want to be? And can I make this work here? Mm -hmm. And that kind of uh, feeds back into what I actually did. Because, you know, I could have a gallery in a big city. Might work. But, you know, a touristy town actually really works. It's, again, back to the numbers. I need X amount of people in here. I need, I need the traffic through here, right? Mm -hmm. Again, I'm not selling cups of coffee and donuts, um, so you don't need everybody coming in, everybody. You just, I just, just the, the people who, yeah. And I need the right people, but right. I definitely need the traffic. Canmore definitely gets the traffic. Um, and economically it's a little more doable. I find than Banff. Banff is, you know, if you want to rent a space on main street, Banff, it's pretty expensive. Mm. Even currently. I mean, it's, it's crazy expensive. It's expensive here in Canmore as well, 
But again, I've, I got the numbers of people. And normally when we have tourists coming in from other countries, uh, especially in the summertime, mm -hmm. it gets pretty darn busy. And then there's, there's people that they go on holidays and they want a memory. Mm -hmm. And guess what? They buy a piece of art for them to commemorate their memory of being on their Rocky Mountain adventure trip mm. and they're from whereverville i think it's so brilliant to be honest yeah well we are brilliant here thank you <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> <laughs> um, <Edit that out. laughs> we are not it. editing that out <laughs> we're leaving it in <laughs> um so what do you remember most about your childhood and what is your favorite color what's my favorite color yeah What's your favorite color purple. yeah purple yeah nice i i think that came from when i was a kid i love grapes yeah and welch's grape juice <laughs> yeah i love grapes too that's <laughs> i just love purple um childhood you know i just i i remember as a kid particularly living in thunder bay going skiing um, I love the landscape there. It's quite hilly in a lot of areas mm -hmm. and a lot of the activities are outdoor based. I mean, uh, camping and fishing and hiking, doing that sort of stuff. And I think that made its way into me wanting to be out West because mm -hmm. again, back in Sudbury, Ontario, uh, Sudbury, Ontario, it was, uh, there was, there weren't as many things that I liked to do readily available. I'd like the aspect of living out West and, Oh, I want to go fly fishing today. It's 10 minutes away. It's over there. Mm. Easily right at hand, right? Close by. And I, do, I mean, just the landscape. I mean, you can't, we get people in here all the time. Man, this is a beautiful place to live. Absolutely. You know, it's kind of like going to Tofino. Try to go there at least once a year. Um, I've been lucky every time I go there, it's sunny. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I was like... <laughs> should own a gallery here it would be kind of neat but as soon as i leave it starts pouring rain <laughs> <laughs> but when it's sunny in tofino man goodness gracious is you ever been there it's beautiful no I've never been okay we gotta go okay okay all right yes. i have a lot okay. of places to go now <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's a beautiful place to be here yeah. i mean people come here to be on on their honeymoons or they'll it's it's amazing you'll see people come in from, from now, where about is this uh, well, Tofino is on the West Coast, okay. Vancouver Island, but specifically here in Canmore, we would, uh, I was going to say, we get people that, you know, well, we're on our honeymoon and we came here and we're from England mm -hmm. uh, or they're from Germany and they've saved, they've saved up and they've gone on their, on their trip out West and they mm -hmm. want a Rocky Mountain experience and yep. they want to see bears and wildlife. They can't have that at home. They can come here. Goodness gracious, you drive up the street just two days ago, there was a herd of elk no less than 70 head of elk. Wow. Then we had snow again, 60 centimeters of snow the next day. I guess that was a sign. <laughs> people will come out here. You watch tomorrow's going to be, once they clear the highway, we've just had 60 centimeters of snow. They're going to come out here because it's going to be sunny, mild, and it's going to look like a post, like a Christmas postcard out here. It's beautiful. Wow. So. That's, um, I mean, I love it here. I love, I love coming here. Just driving into the mountain is an entirely different view. It's, it's you know, I tell people all the time, my favorite thing about Calgary is the mountains. <laughs> it's a broader mountain. So I, I really do love that. You're literally, you know, it, depending on who's doing the driving. I am. <laughs> probably takes you half an hour. No, no definitely <laughs> not. It took me nearly two hours. Today, <laughs> today yeah. The storm. That's <laughs> so good. Normally, it could take you to get to Calgary about 45 minutes. Absolutely. 45 minutes, and you feel like you're a, a planet away. It's a completely different feel in Calgary. Exactly. Right in the mountains, and literally, you can see grizzly bears, yeah. elk, you name it. So... I do. Uh, I am a wildlife concierge, so if, uh, oh. guarantee squirrels and magpies, charcuterie, lunch, and glass of wine, and uh, yeah, all of those are guaranteed. Well, just no. The the magpies and squirrels are guaranteed. Oh, gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what piece of advice would you give a college graduate um, on route to becoming a, a entrepreneur? Find back again to find what you really love to do and pursue that. What really moves your heart? Mm -hmm. Find what you, what gets you excited, and you should be waking up in the morning and going, "Great, 
here's what I'm going to do today. Here's what I want to do today. Mm -hmm. You should be excited about what you're doing. Yeah. When I had my corporate life back to that, I always worked for companies where um, I enjoyed what I was doing. I really enjoyed what I was doing. And it was companies that um, were good at what they were doing and believed in what they were doing. And that's, that was important to me. But again, loved what I was, loved what I was doing. So, and do you have any, um, what would you say are three skill set needed? Three um, skill sets? Three skill sets needed to become wow. a- Three, three elements. Three elements. I would say, um, again, back to do, you know, pursue what you really love to do. What gets you excited about getting up in the morning and going and doing it? Mm-hmm. Um, and lead with your heart. Meaning, you know, you have to take a logistical approach to things and, you know, determine what's working, what's not working. Is this making money? Is this not making money? Eliminate the stuff that's not working. So take a logical approach, um, but lead with your heart. Um, because if you don't believe in what you're doing and what you're selling, it's probably not going to work. Mm -hmm. Right. And believe in what you're doing. I like that. Yeah, absolutely. I wouldn't be in the gallery business and own a gallery if I didn't believe that I want to do this and can make it work. And it's been a challenging year. I mean, with COVID, oh, you're shut down. Oh, you can't have anybody come in. So we've had to kind of reinvent the model of how we do business a few times and Mm -hmm. take a different approach. And again, we're, you know, we got to a point where it was, we decided no matter how small and seemingly insignificant it was, we were doing something to move the ball forward every day. This was during full lockdown closure. Um, just to handle things mentally, we had to do something each and every day just to move the ball forward in the business. And it might've been something as simple as we discovered that doing something as simple as a 20 minute pardon me, a 20 second video and posting it on Facebook mm-hmm. got people excited because it suddenly dawned me. People were trapped at home, can't go out, aren't going out, they're bored, want something to look at and do. So we would do these little short snippet videos, new mm-hmm. stuff. We had new works arriving and stuff and people got excited about it. That's awesome. So sometimes you'll discover things quite by accident uh, and then don't be afraid to think of the box. And have some fun with it. We, my wife and I, we quite often will sit and we'll just brainstorm. Hey, what do you think? You think this is a good idea? Well, yeah, that's a good idea. But what do you say we do it like this? Mm-hmm. Which results in an argument. <laughs> <laughs> but then we have to. Does that happen often? Call you back <laughs> every hour. So you who know, wins? Well, the wife does every time. I just, yeah, relinquish. You just uh, kind of <laughs> try not to drown. <laughs> try not to drown. Uh, yeah, I don't even get thrown a, um, what do they call those? The life saver. Li- life, uh, life uh, those flotations. Flotation device. Yeah. It's not, no, it's not throwing me one. But no, again, you know, lead with your, lead with your heart and uh, move towards what, you know, what you're passionate about. What entrepreneurial tricks have you discovered uh, to keep you focused and productive in your day-to-day business schedule? Busy schedule, I should say. <clears throat> entrepreneurial tricks? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think I was never much on making a list. Here's what I'm going to do today. I've got to get all this list done. Okay. No to-do list for you. Uh, I do have a sort of to-do list. I call it the sort of to-do list. Okay. I have things I need to get done definitely every day. Um, I have sort of a schedule. It just works with my mindset. Uh, I do paint every day. I'm very set and regimented on that. I think the regimented aspect of that works for me. I'm in my studio at a certain time. I happen to be a morning person. I'm more creative in the morning. Mm. So that's when I go to the studio. Sometimes I'll paint at night because I just, oh, I better do that, change that, work on this. But it's not for as long a period of time as it is in the morning. So I have this regimented approach to things, um, but uh, don't overanalyze things. You know, l- make decisions logically. You know, certainly take um, a pragmatic numbers approach to things, mm-hmm. if you will, because you got to make it work from a number standpoint. 
And um, don't be afraid to, and I meant to mention this earlier, don't be afraid if something's not working, pull the pin. Don't keep thinking it's going to work because it's probably not going to work. Mm. You know, sometimes we've had artists who are either difficult to work with or don't under, certainly don't understand the gallery relationship. I've learned to pull the pin early because it's never going to work. You're not going to suddenly change. Change, right. Yeah, because a lot of times you're dealing, you know, you're dealing with adults who they're set in their ways. Then we get some that are new to the business and they want to understand how it works. I actually have certain mentors I refer them to. I say, you should watch this video and read these books. And then you'll understand how it works. And then through experience, you know, there's this whole thing called spidey senses, right? (laughs) But spidey senses actually exist. It's called experience, life experiences. You you know, you're sitting down sometimes, you meet someone, you go, geez, I don't know if that's going to work. I don't know if that relationship is going to work in this gallery. If that, Mm -hmm. And there's usually a reason why. You know, you can analyze, you kind of think why, but usually there's rooted in your life experiences and um, your brain just knows whether that's going to work or not. So you've uh, gotten to a point where you're able to recognize that very early on. Um, but I guess my question is, why do you think so many of us ignore those signals and those signs? Is it because? Because, you know, you'll get the people that, uh, and I've experienced this, where they go, ah, oh, you know, I just I had this feeling um, or they'll... Uh, they'll kind of refer to it as um, gut feeling. Mm. As soon as you say, I had this gut feeling, people go, oh, geez, you know, it's Maverick. And he's, you know, flying his F-18. He just, <laughs> and if he had the needs for speed. It was a gut feel. So if he did this or did that, it's, it's completely, so we don't take it seriously, right? Mm-hmm. That's why I refer to it as the spidey senses because spidey senses are really life experiences. And, and that's, you know, that's knowledge comes with, um, you know, it's the 10,000 hours of doing something in your experiences in the business. I'm sure you've met people where you go, holy cow, I'd probably never interview that person because it would be either a boring or they just would be so nervous on the camera that it would be impossible. And I'd just be wasting a day. Right. Sometimes I do that anyway. Sometimes like, you do it anyways because you just want to practice. Well, why did I do that? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just me asking questions. <laughs> and let's see how far we get before this is. Uh, yeah, it's going to be incredible, boring, but at least I'll practice. After <laughs> at practice. least I'll practice, right? So yeah. you probably have experience and yeah, and know when it's either not going to work or it is going to work, right? Yeah, you you get that feeling. You yeah. know from this interview that you've got forty minutes of film, of which thirty five are going to hit the floor. <laughs> <laughs> You're saying that. I did not say that. <laughs> All right. Um, there was one last final question I had before I can get your final, uh, final words on this interview and then we can wrap things up. Uh, what, uh, what key activity would you recommend entrepreneurs to invest their time into? Bowling. No, I just don't think Jesus. That. <laughs> to invest their time in? Yeah. Um, you know what? And I was just thinking about this just the other day, because I was uh, watching a video, and I mean, no matter how old you get, I'm now 57, there's always new stuff. You don't look good. I know, I'm pretty. Congrats. Yeah, it's, yeah. You've done pretty good. Super, it's creme de peau. (laughs) (laughs) No, (laughs) you you can always learn. You know, and I've always told people too, even bad information is good information. Mm -hmm. What the heck do you mean by that? Well, because, it may be bad information. You just don't do it. That's right. But you learn from the conversation. I have literally had conversations. I remember when I first moved to town without mentioning names, I went to some of the other galleries, said, hey, I'm here. You know, I was just like, oh, I love working with you. Let's make an art community, you know, blah, blah, blah. I was naive. And I remember I got some advice early on from one other gallery. It was the complete opposite of what I should be doing. So I did the opposite of what they suggested I should do because it was bad information. Mm. And you learn from that a hard way. <laughs> I learned a little bit about the hard way. I thought, wait a minute, this person's giving me bad information. Yeah. I'm going to pull a sign. It's like the Seinfeld episode. George Costanza is going for an interview. Right. What should I do, Jerry? Jerry says, do the opposite. That interview, you go to that interview. He's asked, oh, what time would you get to the office? And I think he says, well, I'm like, oh, I sleep in. I might drag myself into the office by noon. <laughs> oh, brilliant. <laughs> you got the job. 
So dude, sometimes you have to do the opposite. Yeah. <laughs> That's a brilliant, uh, absolute brilliant show, by the way. Um, so let's get your final words here. And again, I want to thank you for being on the show. Let's get your final words. Where can people find you? What do you have coming up? Um, and also, yeah, you know, your social media platforms and things like that. Well, uh, you can find us. Uh, we're on Main Street in Canmore, right downtown Canmore. And I should preface that with saying beautiful Canmore. Uh, we are pretty much open every day of the week with the exception of Christmas and Boxing Day and New Year's Day. Uh, but you can always phone ahead to see if we're open or what our hours are. We have a website, uh, fallleafgallery.com. Easy to find. Um, and what was the other part of your question? <laughs> you forgot. <laughs> And, oh, this is going to help you out. Is there any questions or anything that you may want to add now that I probably didn't think of? A talking point that maybe you had in mind for this interview? Well, I wanted to thank you for risking your life today driving out here. <laughs> it's <laughs> definitely a risk. I, I tell you that much. It's the it's highway. <laughs> you're like, what? It's horrible. <laughs> you're lucky. First of all, he's lucky. you're lucky to be alive. Yeah. <laughs> thank yeah. you for making the effort to come out and interview us. Uh, it was actually very interesting and not at all what I expected, but it was really cool. I really enjoyed myself. Feel free to come back anytime. Yeah. Um, but I would say to uh, anybody that's thinking of Can to coming to Canmore, there's a lot to offer in Canmore, not just hiking. There's, uh, there's hiking, biking, fishing. There's so much to do here, but there's beautiful art galleries. Um, and you can come in, even if you're just visiting, you don't have to come into the gallery and think you need to buy something come and meet us and talk art and no question. I've always said to our customers, no question, silly. Um, you know, we'll, we'll answer anything mm. because we want you to feel comfortable and welcome being here. This is like, should be your, your home away from home. So, but yeah, thank you for, uh, having us and, and featuring Fallen Leaf Art Gallery. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's been a, it's been an absolute pleasure. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for uh, tuning in to this episode and another episode of 18AvenuePodcast.com. Make sure uh, you follow us or listen to us on Spotify and wherever else you listen to your podcast. Now, the video edition will be available on YouTube. Of course, you know this already. Thank you all. And that's pretty much it. See you guys next time on 18AvenuePodcast.com. Peace.